Sports Talk crew. I don't know, I'm gonna do a dance or something, I'm not sure. Um, so for those who have come to one of our events before, oftentimes we will uh, have a bit of a Q&A and then we'll solicit questions from the audience, usually through writing. So because we are showing a feature film tonight of an hour and a half, uh, we don't have time for as long of a Q&A as we ordinarily do, so we're, we're going to have about 20 minutes to talk to our, our special guest, School of the Merce, here, and I would ask that if you do have questions, uh, make sure you've got my contact information before you leave, email us your questions, and I'll communicate with Phil to make sure any of those questions are answered. You can also direct questions to me about things that the government might be doing. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, but, uh, but just know that if you haven't got a question answered by me asking Phil the questions tonight, do follow up with me. Uh, and the last thing I will say is, this is, we held a, an event on privacy here at the Fox, we held events on plastic pollution over the summer. Uh, this will be uh, our third topic that we've dealt with here at the Fox, and if you have an interesting topic that you'd like us to pursue, if you have an interesting film you'd like us to show, if there's a speaker you think we absolutely have to have in uh, to address an important issue of the day, please let me know. These are, this is a, I think a really useful way to engage uh, not only people here in Beaches and Stork, but across the city uh, on important issues. And so please do make sure that you're bringing ideas to us. The reason we held an event on plastic pollution was because a Bowmore class and a scout group ha had spoken to me about it and written to me about it. And so where people do bring ideas to our attention, we do pursue them. So please be in touch. And with that, I want to uh, spend a few minutes talking to our special guest, Phil Demers. So Phil Demers, uh, Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here for sure. Always happy to speak with uh, like-minded individuals and people looking to create change and good things. So. so let's start with, for those who don't know you and your background, you worked at Marineland. How long did you work there? Why did you work there? What did you do there? Give us a little bit of context to your history with Marineland. So, um, back in like 1999, applying for a job had everything to do with looking for an ad in the paper. And so uh, I had a like print new news media map uh, ad in front of me. And, uh, you know, I found this job. I was, uh, I, was, I was 20, I believe, 21, 22 almost. And, uh, you know, this job stuck out as, as, as appearing interesting. The only other offer I had, I, I went to school for audio engineering and post, it, what, we, what used to be called post-production, or media, multimedia post-production, which back in 1999 uh, was a fairly expensive course in school, which would eventually become like a download about six months later. These days, any 13-year-old kid can navigate around audio engineering, and I don't even think they used uh, post or media post production or multimedia. Do we even use multimedia as a term? So you had no experience. <laughs> no, not in whatsoever. Working with animals and so what was appealing to Marineland of my uh, of my resume was that I'd work with music, and they thought, well, listen, here's a guy who can uh, maybe cut some audio tracks, maintain audio equipment, and swim with killer whales. <laughs> so right. I think they saw some bang for buck or something. But so I all, all related skills. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in that capacity, it actually was, but. Um, so I saw the ad in the paper, and the only other job opportunity I had was a part-time job in Toronto, which, you know, it wasn't going to pay the bills. Here was this opportunity to maybe stay at home, save some money. So I, I saw it as a temporary opportunity to maybe... But it wasn't temporary. You were it there eventually for... not. Yeah, you're right. So I was there for 12 years thereafter. I often get the question, because you know, now I'm, I, I speak against the... Uh, well, Marineland almost specifically, but, but captivity as a whole. And, you know, there's obviously, we draw a lot of par parallels with the happenings at SeaWorld, for instance, um, and Marineland, but, um, you know, you start this job and you're a young kid, you want to impress your parents, you want to, you want to, you want to impress yourself with a, with a level of commitment, you want to do good. When I started back in 2000, this was a celebrated industry. There was so little information as to what was actually going on back there. And, you know, at first glance, I was not impressed with what I saw. But for me to make sense of it, there had to have been people above me that knew what was going on. There has to have been, there must be someone who knows how to take care of these animals. And I'm going to learn that this is okay. Right? That was sort of the impression on day one. So, officer, you were, you were there for uh, 12 years. 
but I, uh, you, you did this uh, Reddit AMA and uh, you said, or wrote, my first day of Marine Land, my job was to scrub orca blood off the arcade floor. And so, how do you go from that first day to surviving 12 years? And so this is where it gets, that's where it gets difficult. So at 20 years old, it's easy to just assume someone knows what's right. You know, when you're 25, 26, 27, and you're getting closer to the top of the echelon, if you will, of employment, so you start off scrubbing buckets to eventually graduating yourself to a point where you're making decisions, hopefully on the best interest of the animals. I mean, this is what trainers purport to do and be. I mean, that's why we're employed. We are the voice of the animals. And this is where it becomes a little more challenging because it isn't until you're up at the top and you become the person that the younger people assume is the person who knows what's going on, and you start to question yourself, saying, well, wait a second, I'm just, I'm just doing the status quo here. And, and here's where it gets really conflicting, is you're dealing with animals that are amazing and you can't fathom leaving them in the care of someone else. So give us an example. So the first day sounds graphic, but obviously over time you saw much more and from your experience over 12 years, can you give us an example of the impact you saw that captivity, uh, uh, the impact on animals of living in captivity? The, the impact, you can feel it as soon as you walk in. You, it, 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 you can sense it, especially, now bear in mind, when I say walk in, I'm speaking of a place that none of you will have ever seen. Uh, until 2012, there are videos available, but we're talking about off, sort of backstage areas. And when you walk in there, you know that the animals are immediately compromised. You just know it. But there's a level of accepting that that's okay that you come to terms with. But when you start to, in-house, start sort of repeating the atrocities that you feel is unnecessary, like let's say the worst case, for instance, is separating a calf from its mother. Well, in the wild, we know the effects. We've seen what, what becomes of it. We know what happens to these animals when they're brought in. When they're born in captivity, I mean, it seems to make sense that you would keep the calf and mother together and not, in fact, separate them. And separation is always the first goal. It, I mean, over very little time. And there's no sort of describing, witnessing what that does to mother and calf. It's, uh, it's an atrocity that I think that if most people, and, and many of you will come to learn soon, you would never allow for something to happen. Not, not without putting up a fight.